national agency working exclusively on the issue of gender equality are in a very privileged position because we get to see what governments say about this. So this year we collated 176 country reports to say, well, how's the world doing? Um, and this is what we found. There have been big improvements in some areas for sure over the 25 years. Principally improvements in maternal mortality, improvements in health outcomes, improvements in nutrition for girls, improvements in access to schooling. And yet, in spite of that, female labor force participation, for instance, is still two thirds of what it is for men. The gender pay gap is real. The women's leadership gap is real. Women are still victims of violence. So there are a host of issues on which women are not equal. And why does this matter? It matters not just because it's a human right, but because sustainable development goal number five, which is about gender equality, is really the docking goal almost for all other goals. And let me explain a few aspects of this. First and foremost, if you look at the issue, which I think is really front and center today, the issue of leadership and women's participation in decision-making, it is shocking, but true, that less than 25% of the world's parliamentarians are women. Now we've just had a fantastic sea change in the US where we see that women's leadership is really coming onto its own, where we have a first female vice president. But you have to ask, why has it taken so long? And when you look at the statistics on women's leadership as heads of state and government, you begin to get some sense of just how big the gap is. Because believe it or not, less than 10% of the world's heads of state are women, and less than 10% of the world's heads of government are women. And then when you look at gender equal cabinets, there are only 14 countries in the world out of more than 200 that actually have gender equal cabinets. This is in 2021. So that's just on leadership. And so we are at a point where on the public sector side, we don't see enough leadership. But sadly, we don't see it in the private sector either, because when you look at Fortune 500 companies, very few CEOs, I think it's less than 7% are women. So we have a long way to go. Then you look at the issue of women's economic empowerment. I referred already to the fact that female labor force participation is really low. And the puzzling thing is in some countries, for example, in India, where I'm from, you've seen a lot more women going into university. And yet these improvements in university education have not translated into improvements in uh, labor force participation. This is a really big puzzle. And it's true, not just of India, but lots of other middle income economies as well. And so this is something we have to get to the bottom of. And certainly the pandemic hasn't made it easier because all of the data coming out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the US is actually showing that women are not going back to work in the same way as men are. And I'm going to come to why in just a second. But before I do that, I do want to share one other piece of information with you. And that concerns the issue of violence against women. Now, normally one might think that violence against women, yes, it has to do with women's safety and security, but it is actually fundamental to productivity and it is fundamental to closing the gender gap. The horrible thing that has happened during the pandemic is that something that we knew existed as a shadow pandemic has just gotten worse. So we have seen cases of violence against women absolutely go through the roof in countries as far away as Australia and France. So this is a structural issue that needs to be addressed today. It had not been until the pandemic really talked about, I think this is a public health crisis and it needs to be called that. Naturally, during the pandemic, it is hard to draw attention to another public health crisis. But the fact is that this is in fact 
a shadow pandemic and a public health crisis that is reducing productivity because women who are being beaten obviously cannot go to work or do anything else. So this is something that we have to confront head on. The biggest issue that I think we do not talk enough about and is absolutely fundamental is the issue of the care economy. Even before the pandemic, women were carrying three times the care burden that men carry. Why is that? Because of gender norms, stereotypes, and the fact that women have always been the ones who have done the unpaid care work of taking care of children, doing their homework, taking care of the elderly. We have seen this vividly in the pandemic. Not only are most frontline workers women who and carrying double burdens of work in the frontline, but also care burdens at home, but we have also seen that this care burden is what explains the fact that so many women are not going back to work. So until governments start to address the care burden and until corporations in the private sector begin to speak about the care burden and begin to have policies that provide paid leave, sick leave, parental care, paternity leave, we are not going to be able to solve the issue of men, women's equal participation in uh, the economy, in society and in politics. So given this dismal situation, and I do think it's dismal, and I think we cannot be complacent, and I think we need to have a sense of urgency around what needs to be changed. What is it that can be done? Well, it's not hopeless. There are things that can be done. The first and foremost is there needs to be political will. Governments need to stand up and to say, we are going to work on the issue of gender equality. So it's a really a leadership challenge. Companies, CEOs, heads of corporations need to stand up and say we are committed to gender equality. And that doesn't mean just diversity in leadership ranks. It means walking the talk. It means converting sweat equity into decision equity at every step in the corporation, at every step of government. It needs to be mainstreamed. It is not a nice to have. It is a must have. So that's the first thing, you need political will, you need leadership. The second is there needs to be an agenda of work to actually eliminate discriminatory laws. There are an amazing number of countries where the laws actually discriminate against women. They cannot have collateral, they cannot borrow. They are discriminated against when it comes to property rights. So all of the issues that prevent women from getting access to economic resources whether it is as individuals, as consumers, as business owners, need to be dealt with systematically. So there needs to be comprehensive legal reform. So that's the second piece. The third piece is actually training and working with organizations and countries to make sure that we are grooming women leaders. And I wanna share a story with you about leadership in the most unlikely place. So I was in a refugee camp in uh, Northern Uganda last year. Seems like a century ago, but it was only last year. And I met these women who were refugees from Sudan and they had walked six days to get to this refugee camp. And I was talking to them about, I was giving them awards for leadership in the local council. And um, I said to the woman, you know, I was asking her about her life experience. She was thrilled her children were learning English. Um, she explained to me, I mean, boy, you really see the effect of violence against women that she had basically had to pay for her way to the camp by agreeing to be assaulted at several points along the way. And she said when she got to the camp, she couldn't move for six days, but then she pulled herself together because she had children. And um, she said to me, I'm so pleased that you're giving me this award for being a leader in the local council. And I said, how has it changed your life? And she said, well, I'll give you a simple example. She said, at night, it was very unsafe for us to walk back to our you know, uh, little uh, camp area. And so when there were women on the local council, we asked for lighting so that men couldn't attack us at night. And she said, that has made a big difference in our lives. And then she said, the other thing is, you know, we get food packets delivered by relief organizations. But she said the food packets were too big. 
for women to carry. So we asked them to cut them in half so we could put them on our heads and carry them back to our families. And so she said, I feel my role in decision-making has changed my life and it's changed my children's lives because I'm safe. I can be there for my kids and I can make sure they go to school. And so, you know, in just that one incident, you know, you saw at how at the local level decision-making was changing people's lives. And so just imagine if we could cascade that to everything, how people's lives could change. We know already there's plenty of empirical research which shows that when you have women and more diverse decision-making, you get better outcomes. So it's not just at the local level in Northern Uganda, it is in every aspect and that's what we have to work for. And one final thing, this agenda is not a women's agenda. This is a universal agenda. We need men and boys involved. That means this starts in the family unit. It starts at home. It starts with changing stereotypes, cultural norms and attitudes. And those are things that cannot be done just by women. So this is an agenda that we have to work on men, boys, girls, and women together to make sure that we are really marching towards the sustainable development goals because there isn't enough research on what happens when you actually positively impact women's lives, except for two pieces that I want to talk about. One is a piece that Larry Summers wrote when he was the chief economist of the World Bank. And he showed that investments in girls' education are probably the single most important investments that you can make in terms of returns to development. And that remains true. It was true then, though that was done for South Asia. It really is something that is global, but it's true today as well, because what we have seen under the pandemic is that girls are dropping out of school, that girls are getting married off, and there is a really big problem with respect to making sure that we don't lose a whole generation of girls and young women. So that's education. And then the second piece that I want to just mention quickly is a piece that the IMF did last year, which showed that if you address the issue of child marriage, which is another form of violence against women, that you actually can add 1.3 points to a country's GDP. So we need more pieces of research like that, which actually make the case. Of course, most of us in the audience are converts. So we believe this to be true, but there are a lot of people who don't actually think that gender equality is something that you need to work on systematically to address. We have to get to those people. I'm very confident that with the renewed emphasis that people are putting on achieving the SDGs as we march into the decade of action towards Agenda 2030, which is only 10 years away, we can use the opportunity of this crisis to rebuild back better. But it's not going to happen organically. It needs each and every one of us to speak up and to speak loudly about the importance of gender equality and talk about it with the same urgency that we talk about when we talk about other issues like climate change, like inequality. These are connected and these are fundamentally important for us building a better world as we build back better. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Bhatia. We will hold audience questions um, for you until after the panel discussion. And in order to launch that, I am very pleased to introduce alumna Diana Enriquez, who will moderate our panel discussion. An award-winning financial journalist, Diana is the author of A First Class Catastrophe, The Road to Black Monday, The Worst Day in Wall Street History, The Wizard of Lies, Bernie Madoff, and The Death of Trust, which is a New York Times bestseller, and three other books on business history. As a staff writer for the New York Times from 1989 to 2012, and as a contributing writer since then, she has largely specialized in investigative reporting on white collar crime, market regulation, and corporate governance. Diana served on the GW Board of Trustees from 2011 to 2019, and was a member of the Elliott School Board of Advisors for over 10 years. Diana, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Alana. And it was a, it's a pleasure to be here and it was thrilling, Anita, to hear your comments. I'm joined on the panel today by two good friends on the, from the Elliott School. Alumna Julie Monaco is the Global Head of Cities Public Sector Group in the Corporate and Investment Banking Division of Cities Institutional Clients Group. She leads the banking coverage team and is responsible for providing a range of uh, financial services to public sector clients globally. These clients include central banks, central government agencies, state and local governments, supranationals, development banks, non-governmental organizations, and academic institutions. Julie has consistently been recognized for her leadership in the financial sector, with American Banker naming her one of the 25 most powerful women in banking and finance, 12 out of the last 13 years. In addition to IWE, she serves as the chair of the Elliott School's Board of Advisors. As governance advisor to Atlantic Street Capital, fellow alumna Susan Stalker launched the first private equity firm effort to recruit women for portfolio executive positions, company boards, and customer advisory boards. She recently retired as chairman and co-founder of the Women Corporate Directors Foundation, the only global membership organization and community of women corporate directors. Susan is the president and CEO of PartnerCom Corporation and co-founded Onboard Bootcamp, an insider's guide on how to be selected to a corporate private company or advisory board director position, and the Belizean Grove, a preeminent community and retreat for leading women who share knowledge and connections. Welcome, Julie and Susan. I'm delighted to have you with me today. Um, I'd like to kick it off with the observation that we've all seen politically um, uh, and socially a perception gap uh, about issues of discrimination. It seems too often that those who don't feel it don't see it. So I'd like each of you to give us kind of a, a temperature check, a tour of the horizon of the current state of uh, um, opportunity, gender opportunity in the worlds that you occupy. Julie, could you start us off? Sure. Um, in the world of finance, there is still sort of a gap of representation of women at the most senior levels, although we've done a lot of work at making sure that um, we recruit women and men equally, but it's still we still continue to have a problem when it gets to the most senior levels. And we're working on that. And I think that there's a lot of programs in place that are slowly but surely addressing some of the issues. But when you talk, what you're talking about, Diana, is subconscious bias, right? There are people, right. there are, are stories and um, that people bring up about the way, you know, about ways people feel like they haven't been presented with an opportunity or they've been discriminated against, where unless you actually talk about it, it People don't see it like exactly what you're saying. And so we're having, we're forcing those tough dialogues and it's not just for women, obviously with the Black Lives Matter um, and all of the racial injustice that we saw over the summer, we really is forcing companies to bring people in, and I'm part of the City Women Affinity Group, but bringing people together and having those tough conversations. And some of the biases, subconscious bias that we still see with um, women and men, and I talk about it in a lot of women's groups and I'll give a few examples. And Anita made reference to this in terms of how much women are really expected to do caregiving. I say to men in my company, which is, I've made this comment, it's kind of funny. I say, a man would have no problem bragging that he's leaving at two o'clock in the afternoon because his high school son is in the champion lacrosse match. And that's why he has to leave today. But that man would have never been caught dead saying he's leaving work because his two-year-old has a fever and he's got to go pick up that two-year-old at daycare. And that is, that is a gender bias. Yeah. It's just assumed that when you get that emergency phone call from the daycare center or from the nanny or from the school, that it's the mother that's going to go running home. And so we have to change. And I think Anita is right. We have to change um, the men's attitudes and some of these cultural norms. And we talk about the fact that representation and City is very proud to be the first firm that released the raw data on gender pay gap. 
And what we see is that pe- women are being paid the same for the same jobs. So our gap is not really about a gap of not paying women equally. It's about not having enough women at the senior levels. And so you, how you have to do that is start setting goals and setting goals around if there's 50% of the women coming into the firm are women, I mean, analysts coming in are women, why aren't 50% of the MDs women? What are we doing to lose them along the way? How are we mentoring them? How are we changing the attitudes? Most people, as you would say, would see that there's no, and I didn't face a lot of discrimination, but there's subtle things that happen. When the really big job comes up, um, there's often a situation where it's assumed that a woman won't be mobile, um, right. that not asking her. So we developed, we developed at City, we developed um, talent management um, where we have women management and development leadership programs, but we also tag women in the annual talent review and look very closely if a woman's been a high performer and been in the same role for three years, are we giving her, are we making sure she has the right opportunities? And then getting more disciplined that as jobs open, people have an unconscious bias and tend to just fill that job with someone who they know. And so, and so if it's mostly men in charge, it's going to be men that they're going to hand those jobs to. But if you have a discipline process to have um, equal slates and women have the opportunity to compete for those jobs, because we've made an effort to say that we're interviewing 10 people, five of them are going to be women. It's amazing how many women get those jobs once they're given those opportunities. So some of the, those are some of the, biases I still see, the cultural biases we still see around why women um, sometimes are not as far ahead as they should be, and then how, how, um, how, the, how I see companies like my own trying to address it. So those are encouraging signs of effort, certainly, to address the, and you're very wise to have pointed it out, that it is an unconscious bias too often. As I said, people who do not feel the force of, of discrimination are just blind to it, and they don't even realize they have those blind spots. I'd like to toss the same question to you, Susan, if you can reach us on that. I think you're coming in by phone. Super. So, yes, obviously, there are a lot of biases out there. And so what you need to be able to do um, is constantly reinforce other women's strength. So, for instance, if you're sitting around um, a boardroom table or a meeting table, and a woman makes a point, and everyone ignores it, and then a man makes the same point. There was this, oh, but a great point. You've got to go back and say, yes, it is a great point. And the female made it, you know, and give her name, you know, sir first. And so let's follow up on that. So if men keep finding that you're uh, not letting them sort of steal someone else's idea and get the credit for it, you very politely uh, are able to sort of uh, get your point of view uh, across. Um, uh, Susan, you've seen, uh, I know, a lot of change because I've been as a reporter covering the world yes. that you and Julie both uh, have spent your brilliant careers in. And so I know you have, have seen a lot of change, but I, I wonder how you would assess the state of play for women opportunities in the world of finance, particularly investment management today. Um, it, it, it still feels to me like we've got a long, long way to go. You're closer to it and deeper into it than I am. I'd love to hear you to just to, you know, give us a, 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 temp, a temperature check. Well, in our case, just like Atlantic Street Capital, um, where I'm the first woman hired, uh, as, as we know, as we think uh, in, in America, to recruit women and diversity candidates to come onto the boards of our companies. And just, and I've been doing that throughout, bringing women on. And then most recently, I said, we also have to obviously increase diversity on our boards. And for one of our boards, we just brought in two African-American women and an African-American man. So the candidates are there uh, and it's, uh, they're easy to find. It's just have the, the commitment from top management, you know, to take people on it. Sometimes it means that you have to sort of take someone that does not have proven board experience, but they've got great experience um, in the C level, and you give them that opportunity to grow. And in private equity, you don't have to be able to sort of show you've been a corporate board before. You just have to be able to solve whatever problems there are. A question about the international aspect of this. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the idea of uh, board quotas gender quotas for corporate boards. I mean, in theory, 
Uh, and I'm speaking, I'm putting on my reporter hat here. When you think about it, it's kind of shocking to hear Anita say that the private sector situation for uh, representation of women is so much worse than the public sector. Think about it. You don't have to run for office. There's no political campaigns. You don't have to get votes. One guy can say, hey, you're on my board. Problem solved. So in theory, the power to fix it is so much more readily at hand um, in the private sector than it is in the public sector. I know some nations have looked at corporate uh, quotas for, uh, for gender, and there's been some discussion. Some states here have looked at it. Um, the UK has given the, given the run. I'd like both of you to give me your responses to uh, whether a gender quota is uh, a useful thing, where you've seen it work, where it doesn't work. Um, and if it, uh, if it doesn't work, why not? Quotas certainly have worked in Europe. Uh, in, in France, for instance, in, in the year that it had passed the lower house but hadn't gotten to the Senate, the number of women bo on boards doubled in one year. Well, I guess everyone wanted to get the best women before uh, they went elsewhere. Uh, but there's also, uh, in addition to quotas, there's targets. Countries like Malaysia have a target uh, of one-third of government, one-third of, of business, um, being women. So targets are another way of approaching it as well. Yeah, I, I personally um, prefer targets than quotas. I just think that there's a, there's a negative, there's a negative connotation with quotas. And I think that often when you're a woman or you're a minority, you're already fighting that bias of did you get the role, right? Because you're a woman or you're a minority. And I think if there's a quota in there, it actually makes that worse. I think it, it. I think it should be a target, and I think we're seeing more and more CEOs prioritizing what is important. And and I and I so I, I know that there are a lot of companies out there that have targets. Um, myself, I'm participating in a board mentoring program right now where they're trying to get to their their company to um, a certain level of women on their board, and so they're actually bringing women to sit in board meetings to actually mm -hmm. mentor them on how to be on boards. You know. And, and and there are companies where they will bring someone in um, as a possible board member for the for the for the first year and see how it how it works. And mm -hmm. it's interesting. Sometimes the men have failed this because they come on too strong. While none of the women have, have failed, they haven't you know sat at the table, made some comments, and shown they can do the job. The uh, idea of targets, of course. Um, sounds to me, frankly, like good intentions. And of course, we've had good intentions for decades now and have seen infinitesimal progress, particularly in the corporate directorships and the CEOs. I mean, um, I've, there were more CEOs uh, in, uh, more women CEOs at the corporate 500 companies when I left the active work at the Times in 2012 than there are now. And so it, you know, it doesn't feel like there's a big surge of target hitting here. I don't know if we, we need to make it competitive. Maybe if we gave trophies for getting the most women on your board, the guys on these boards would, would get behind it. But um, you know, persuade me that targets are achievable and, in, and somehow so socially, at least in terms of social pressure, enforceable. The Catalyst has been giving big awards for years and, and, and big dinners uh, honoring uh, companies that make a difference. Well, okay. Recognize think, progress, Julie. Yes. I would say that measurement, you can't, you can't achieve what you don't measure. And so I think everyone is falling all over themselves to have the right measurements to show that they're measuring progress against the target and trying to set goals and stake in the ground. And I know that we're doing that um, at our firm. And I know that, that, that we, are at, we are drilling down those targets to the lowest levels. I think that, I think companies, I think you're right, Dana, that a lot of companies had good intentions but they didn't actually drive those management targets down to every single manager in the firm and make it part of how they're evaluated every year and their compensation if they don't make progress. And I think that, that we're starting to see it driven down. And part of it is around ESG scoring. Companies are getting much more focused on the ESG scoring, which is how they as a company are progressing on all the sustainable development goals. And thanks to the United Nations for- well, that's, just, that's just a good little definition there for our uh, 
oh, for yeah. our uh, audience. 17, there are 17 sustainable development goals that the United Nations have set. So um, if you don't, if you don't know what they are, just look up United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The world has signed up for these goals, but corporate America and the investor community have signed up for these goals. And what we have seen this year during this pandemic is an absolute explosion of bonds that are issued that are social <laughs> bonds and sustainability bonds. And we're also seeing bonds that are specifically towards women. Um, and Anita and my team are actually in dialogue. My team down in Mexico just issued a pink bond, which is around investing money in, in, in economically empowering women in small businesses. So we're seeing that investors, there's a huge investor demand to want to do well while doing good. Yes, and I think uh, Susan can probably, uh, excuse me, Susan can probably back me up on this, that there is growing research, just as Anita mentioned, that more research of the proof of the importance of gender equality uh, is needed. Um, there's been important research to push back against the myth that there's a trade-off between performance and, um, uh, and socially responsible investing, to use its, its old term, uh, that somehow you're going to have to uh, give up uh, uh, you know, a couple of points on the upside if you, if you try to do the right thing. And I think there's been some substantial findings that that's not the case, that mm -hmm. actually corporations that are focused on environmental goals, uh, social diversity uh, goals, um, uh, do as well or better than uh, corporations that are paying less attention to those yeah. Fill me in on those. Uh, the yes, there are, num current. there are numerous studies that sort of show um, that having uh, more women uh, on, on, the, on the board uh, keep you out of getting into trouble. Women don't try to uh, buy as many companies. Uh, they try to do a better job you know, where they are. They achieve better financial results, uh, good, better reputation, uh, uh, and really work very hard on um, trying to make sure that uh, they are retaining people uh, as, as, as well. And the ESG funds have performed quite well. But I think that we, the way we look at it is, is diversity of thought. So we always talk about what is the business proposition of wanting a diverse team. It's because if you don't have a diverse team and you have a really complex problem you're trying to solve, and there's 10 people around the table and they all went to the same prep school and the same college and come from the same exact background, you're going to have one approach to solve that problem. If you have 10 people from all different backgrounds, you're going to have 10 different lenses and your chances of solving that problem and being more creative um, just gets multiplied by 10. And Absolutely. so that is, that is the business rationale for why diverse teams. And, and there's tons of studies about that. And, you know, I luckily work in a firm that is incredibly diverse uh, you know, and in many parts of the world, we are leading the way in terms of our representation of women. We have chief country officers at city and, you know, for each country. And um, we have um, over 30 of them now are women in places like Saudi Arabia and Jordan, um, where, you know, our chief country officer representing the entire city franchise and that business are women. So, so we do see the progress. That's great we to see. I want to wrap up with uh asking each of you, and this is sort of our lightning round wrap up question uh, to ask each of you, what, as we close, is the single short mm -hmm. on your business card um, piece of advice that you would give uh, to women trying to navigate the current landscape of, of opportunity? What, uh, what habit or rule or practice uh, was there that helped you most in your careers? Julie, why don't you start? Go out of your comfort zone. I think that's go out of push yourself out of your comfort zone. I think that women often, and I've seen it with women who work for me, don't raise their hand for a different role or a challenging role because women focus on the 10% of the skill sets or knowledge that they don't have. Um, whereas a man that has only 40% of the skill and the knowledge will raise their hand and focus on the 40% that they have. The woman focuses on the 10% she doesn't have. And because of that, she doesn't raise her hand. Okay. Raise your hand. Good raise advice. Susan? Push yourself out. I think that um, in, in many cases, women just think they should be there to sort of uh, help grease the gears. But the real leaders are the ones that are able to shift the gears. And I think you've got to, it, 
whenever possible, um, show that you're able to sort of think outside the box, bring um, new assets, you know, to play, new contacts to play. Talented, successful women directors will not just bring their knowledge, but also their networks, their buyer's power, their funding power and expertise to help strategize and grow a sound business. And so you really sort of reach out to uh, all those networks. So raise your hand and put your hand on the gear shift. Okay, those are great. And thank you both for your generosity and your thoughts today. I'm delighted to have been part of this uh, panel. And now I'm happy to hand off the virtual podium to one of our brilliant Elliott School students. We're actually going to pivot for one second. Okay. Take the um, host prerogative and actually turn the camera over to Gina Amber Crummy when Stanley, as she's the new vice chair, she has a question. So I'll allow her to ask, ask it directly. Thank you so much. That was great, ladies. I'm so excited to be joining all of you on this amazing journey that we are going to carry out. I did have a question though, the discussion was so interesting when we talked about the pros and cons of quotas versus targets. And I felt we, we couldn't leave it where we left it insofar as when you talk about targets, and I think Diana mentioned, you know, good intentions, mm -hmm. we've been talking about inclusion, gender parity for so very long, as we all know. And if you don't have a quota, and I speak, of course, as a brown female, so I know that additional burden that we carry when we have to deal with, is it a quota? Where are you there because right. you're a girl or you're brown? But without a quota, how do we get there? Because it's been made abundantly clear that people who run corporations, men who run corporations, European Americans who run corporations are quite happy having more danger without women, are quite happy not to make more money that they might make if they had a more diverse board or more diversity of thought to come to solutions and good recommendations, mm -hmm. et cetera. So since they've shown those, that business case is not making the case, how then do we stop saying, all right, you won't do it, you haven't done it, then we're gonna set a quota because we are gonna get people there. And the fact that men don't have to apologize because they got there because their dad or their mom went to a particular school or worked in a particular company or was able to call up their neighbor and God, you know, I got my yeah. daughter a job because she knows somebody who was in the right place to get her a job at an embassy. Yeah. That's the way things work. And they don't have to apologize for that. So I, you know what? If you're hiring me because I'm brown and I'm female, that's fine. Just get me <laughs> at the door because I'm going to do well for you. So I, 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 I think we may hamper ourselves a bit by saying no quotas. That's my view, but I'd love my colleagues to address it. Thank I you. love your I love your view. I'm I'm putting my hand up for that, but I'd love to hear Julie. You had some reservations I about do. quotas, and maybe you could. You're the best to tackle this question. I don't think it's, it's I don't think it's a perfect answer because I I do get that it is it is I just get concerned that it's a, it's it's a little bit of you know a sledgehammer type of move. You know, you're forcing something. Um, and, 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 and are, there the, are you really evaluating the negative consequences, right? In terms of people um, being forced in. And I think that there's so many talented, diverse people out there. So maybe there isn't a downside. Maybe just we would get more equity in terms of diverse people filling these roles. So maybe I'm really concerned about. But I am seeing a shift. And some of the shift that we're seeing is, you know, we had about a year ago, a very, very important financial company literally call up the deal team and say, you know what, if there's no women on this deal team, don't even bother coming to pitch to us. Because yes, but uh, let me counter that with Twitter, which took its IPO to market to the staggering astonishment of every, every financial reporter I know. It brought its IPO to market without a single woman on its board. Right. So, uh, you know, Gina's, Gina's point is if, um, if what we're doing, I mean, what, what's the definition of insanity? You know, right. you keep doing what you're doing and expecting a different result. So we're not getting, there's 7% of women uh, CEOs and, and a smaller, you know, a small single, a double digit number for 
corporate boardroom representation. So um, I think I share some of Gina's impatience that um, we need to try something new. Now, maybe it's, maybe we just need a better PR wrapping for quotas. I'm not sure, but certainly I think we do need to recognize that the, uh, the pace of change in the private sector, which as I said, theoretically ought to be faster than in the public sector isn't. And we need to start trying to figure out why that is and what's, uh, and what's happening. I'm sympathetic to the, the yeah. nomenclature of, of quotas, but believe me, I, I, I share Gina's concern. Uh, it's just not changing as rapidly as it should. But one last thing to the uh, question about advice as you move up the ladder. And, and mine is bring a posse with you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have found when, and particularly ladies and brown people that we're, we're in another moment here where we may be able to make some progress. And so far as I have found uh, on a board that was interested in having me, you know, taking hold of the moment, um, but me saying, you know, I'll, I'll be the only brown person on this board I come with four people. Do you want me? I will bring you four excellent people, but you need five of us and you need us together. Mm -hmm. And so five of us came on that board, but because I insisted I was not coming alone. Mm -hmm. And I've learned in my career that one person cannot make change. You need a posse to amplify your view so you don't feel alone. That when you're putting something out there that there are other people who are going to understand it and help others understand it. And you can make far greater progress that way. And, you know, know your worth, know your value, bring a posse. I'm done. Sorry. A great point. I want to leave time for the questions. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I know there's so much to discuss. Um, and I want to turn it over now to um, Hannah Jackson, who is a sophomore student at the Elliott School, and she's co-president of the student group, which co-sponsored uh, this event, which is Young Black Pro Professionals and in International Affairs. Thank you to each of our panelists for sharing your wisdom, experience, and expertise uh, with us this afternoon. As mentioned, my name is Hannah Jackson. I'm a sophomore here in the Elliott School and also the founder of a new student organization, uh, young Black Professionals International Affairs. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll now turn to the audience for uh, their questions. And although we may not get to all of them, we hope to get as get to as many as possible in our, our re remaining time. Um, our first question is a blend from alumna Dina Taubin and alumna um, and I, we member Gina Segal. To all panelists, how can we get more women on corporate boards? And how can we change the dynamic that currently sees more women offering nonprofit board service, but not for profit uh, board service? Um, well, thank you for uh, that question. I'm going to suggest that Susan's the best uh, uh, one to feel that, uh, Susan, that, that this is right in your sweet spot, right, right, right across right. the plate for you. Right, so lots of ways to get more women um, on, on the boards. First of all, um, Boards are now looking for people that have uh, expertise uh, with the internet, expertise with internet marketing, and those are obviously skill sets of often younger people, not just those of us who've been around for a long time. So you see boards taking women now and men uh, onto boards in their 30s. And so that's a great opportunity to be able to use some of these you know, new skill sets that um, the rest of us don't have. Another trend that's happening now uh, is that more and more boards are taking people with an HR background. And once again, that's been a woman's ghetto in the past. Women headed, handed, headed HR, and men were off running various divisions of the world. So that's another way to sort of look about getting on to a, uh, to a board is having this uh, HR uh, uh, background, because in today's world, you want to not only recruit these bright young people, but you want to be able to retain them and having the good background of how you do that um, is very important. It's also very important to, you know, life is one big interview. So you need to be seen on the nonprofit boards where the men play. So don't go on, on a nonprofit board where it's maybe a great cause, but it is a group of women just working together on something. Go to a, a, 
the nonprofit board where you're on the finance committee. Go to a nonprofit board where you're where the men are. That's where you're going to be sort of seen because, you know, they're constantly asked, we got to put a woman on the board. They don't know that many women, but if they've seen you and they work with you and they know that you know, they can work with you. They're going to recommend you. So you've got to get into, in, into their world as well. I think that's great advice. Uh, next question. I'd now like to turn to a question from staff member Mindy Galvan. Uh, Ms. Batia, can you talk about what work is being done in the Middle Eastern countries regarding women in the workplace? Uh, Mindy adds, as a Middle Eastern woman, I have been doing a lot of research and am interested because job discrimination is rampant. So there are several things that are happening in the Middle East. Uh, most important, I would say, is the work on elimination of discriminatory laws because it is remarkable how many laws there are on the books that actually prevent women from getting into the workplace or having access to resources to start their own businesses or you know, be productive uh, members of society. So actually working on the legal frameworks is really important. And then we have this campaign called, um, well, we have two that I wanna mention. One is He For She, where we pick prominent male leaders to be champions of gender equality. So. Uh, I'm trying to think who we have. Um, I think we have actually the Sheikh of Dubai as a, a champion, and we have other prominent leaders in the Middle East also as champions. And then we are working with marketing companies. We have an alliance called the Unstereotype Alliance, which goes to the whole issue of unconscious bias that Julie mentioned uh, about changing people's attitudes and changing gender stereotypes. So. You know, this is work that takes years. It's, it's a hard slog and it's, you're not gonna see results overnight, but you have to kind of chip away at this. And, you know, hopefully in a generation, things will change. Um, and then the final piece is digital access because the digital divide is not just a divide between rich and poor, but it's also a divide between girls and boys because you can be sure if there's one computer in the house, it's gonna to go to the boy. And so we are also working to close the gender digital divide. So these are some of the ways. Our next question is from alumna uh, Anna Hedlund. Uh, she has a question for any of the panelists to tackle. What are your thoughts regarding competition among women themselves around achieving positions of leadership? And how do we balance supporting each other and advancing women's leadership while also competing for a small pool of opportunities? Mm, I'm, uh, I'm gonna grab that one myself um, <laughs> because the, the queen bee syndrome uh, was very much a thing when I started out as a, a financial writer. Um, and it, I'd seen it time and time again, where a woman had climbed up to the masthead of a publication, a major newspaper, a major magazine, um, and didn't, and pulled the ladder up behind her, you know, didn't, um, pull, didn't pull anybody else up, uh, up along with her. And it, it became, um, uh, not a good thing to be thought of as a queen bee, but, I think the questioner is right that there has been an unwillingness on the part of women to be as open about this kind of old girls network, if you will, um, that, um, that we have to help each other uh, get, uh, get opportunities. And I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm in the business, obviously, that, that is under terrific, terrific economic structural dislocation. The newspaper business publishing in general uh, is under terrific stress. Uh, we don't know how many lifeboats there are out there. And so I do understand the concern about, um, you, know, you know, trying to get more women into the lifeboat and, and uh, risking your own seat there. But my personal feeling is that what goes around comes around that women who help other women are not only seen as um, being on the side of the angels, as Anita was talking about, being on the side of 
historic forces that improve the world, but also they're seen by men as people of power, people of uh, loyalty. That, in a way, um, uh, demonstrates qualities that, you know, male or female are respected. They're seen as um, the, the things that uh, are admirable in people. Uh, nobody in the newsroom liked the queen bee and nobody respected or admired her or wanted to be her. So I think that that's, um, <clears throat> I think that do the right thing and don't worry about that seat in the lifeboat. One of the I, women, I agree. I think, one I of think the women you, also, you helped will pull you up. Offer to be both a mentor and a sponsor. And, and by mentoring and sponsoring, you're able to help bring people up and people admire that. Agreed. Well, and I, I think you also have to, you know, I, I believe that you mentor everybody and, and you can balance that with, you know, you know, I guess it's Madden Albright had this famous saying of, you know, there's a special place in hell for women that don't help other women. And, and I think that, you know, as a woman, you're obligated to create opportunities for women to be able to compete for positions and have the same opportunity. So you have a special role as a senior woman to make sure that that unconscious bias is being exposed and that you're fighting against it so that women in your organization can have the equal opportunity. But you also want to be seen as an overall leader that, that men and women would come to you for mentoring. And, and I have been mentored by more men than women in my career. And I have, and because our industry is heavily male, I've probably mentored just as many men as I've mentored women. Um, but, but I have to take a different approach in terms of how I champion women internally to overcome that, that, you know, that, that unconscious bias and remind people that just because she's a woman doesn't mean we shouldn't ask her whether she wants to move to another country you know, and, and things that they just men assume because you're married and you have children that you're not mobile and don't offer you that big opportunity. And those are the kind of things. So you can, you can balance both. You, you, you all each mentioned mentorship and the collaborative work that needs to be carried out um, in order for all women to progress and, and, and move further. And, and I think that segues into our last question, question which is from alumna Alicia um, Shapar. Um, she asks, what role have mentors played in contributing to your success in advancing your careers? Ah, uh, well, crucial. I think all of us would just say it's been, it's been immense. Uh, it's immensely helpful. Um, and as Julie said, <clears throat> since she, she and I both entered, as did Susan, entered um, fields where we were going to be one of the only women in the room on almost any occasion, uh, that, that many of those helpful early mentors were men um, who believed in us and then believed in giving us a chance. Um, the, the, I think the important uh, thing is to choose your mentors carefully to be sure that the, the that the, that your mentors reflect the values that you want people to uh, just to define in you, because um, you are known by the company you keep, and mentors um, mentorship um, is uh, is a judgment call on your part as well as on the mentors' part. Um, and the very best mentors I've had, I'll be kind of were. Uh, it was a two-way street. They were learning something from me as well as I was learning something from them. And those are the opportunities to watch for where your experience as a young digital native, someone who's grown up in the world of digital uh, life, um, can help inform your mentor just as your mentor's knowledge about navigating office politics, uh, negotiating for a raise can inform you. So it's the two-way mentorship that I think is the really promising uh, opportunities. Uh, Julie? 
Yeah, I would say that um, one of the most important things that when I think back on some of my mentors and most of my mentors were men, um, was the mentors that gave me really tough feedback on things that were going to make me better. And I think that is something as a woman going into the workforce, you have to be open to that criticism and almost seek that criticism because there is an unconscious bias by men to not want to give negative feedback to a woman. Right. And we talk about this cultural divide of men growing up from the time they were big brothers of don't make your sister cry. Don't make your mother upset that men, it is, it is, they, they sometimes have a hard time giving really tough feedback to women. And, and so you, you know, it's a two way thing, but I think um, some of the, you know, the mentors that were the best mentors were the ones that, that encouraged me. And I developed you know, that two-way relationship that Diana's talking about where I was, I think they were learning from me as well. And it was often a boss. So it was, it was a working relationship. It wasn't just some random mentor that was in a different part of the firm, but the one, but being able to accept that tough feedback and not let it make you cry or, or God forbid, don't ever cry. Don't ever cry. <laughs> don't ever cry. But, um, but, but being able to accept that feedback and, and grow from it and, and seek that kind of feedback and make it okay for the man to give you that feedback because it's not their nature to do that. And that's one of those gender divides that we have to overcome for women to get better. If they don't get the tough feedback and don't get mentored, then they don't learn and they don't progress. Susan, what can you add? We have to. Yeah, I think right now seconds. we're facing. I think we're facing. I think we're facing a problem because we're not doing as much traveling and business trips were a way you'd have time to have a drink and sort of uh, talk to people and see how they inter interacted. Um, so that's a problem. And I also think in part of the Me Too movement has scared some men from wanting to to, to travel and, and have women on the on, on on the team. So we've got some. Some, some tough things now making it harder. So you're gonna have to be able to find ways to connect and ask for feedback um, on the phone, you know, during uh, talks such as this, because we're not gonna have as much downtime um, with the people you used to travel with and be able to do things with. That's a good point. I think that that's been noted as, as um, you know, an unfortunate uh, um, reaction a backlash i would say uh, it's not yes. justified at all but it's but it certainly is happening and all i can say is this is time for women to really step up and step into those roles as mentors um uh, given the the consequences of the me too movement of the pandemic and of and a lot of you know a lot of smart people think those impacts on business conferences business travel um, you know, kind of extracurricular business con uh, activity is is probably going to be off the table for a good while, and possibly right. in some cases for uh, permanently. So, uh, right. So we got to so find I, new ways around it. We do, and, and and women have to think creatively about new ways, not only to find a mentor, but to be a mentor. Yeah. This they is also give practical advice. Uh, I don't recall who pointed out about don't cry, don't cry. We all uh, did. We okay, <laughs> but the reality is, is that we do cry, and we cry often in rage and in frustration. And in the world, there is a lot of it, especially if you believe you are not getting your due. Practically speaking, if you know you are going in for a tough conversation, because you can anticipate those when you're seeking feedback, take with you a bottle of ice cold water. You will find that when that cold water hits the back of your throat, it will help stop the urge to cry. <laughs> and taking strategic sips of ice cold water can help keep your equanimity to get through that tough meeting. And I try and share this advice with as many women as I can, because many of us, we don't want to hurt anyone. So right. we cry to keep the other person safe. So take the ice cold water with you. Okay. All right. I, I, on that I, note, I'm going to get. Exactly. I'm going to leave the last. I'm going to leave the last word to Anita Batia because I saw that she had unmuted as well. So please uh, give us your thoughts. Look, everybody's said many things that I agree with, and I like Julie. Most of my mentors were men, and I was just thinking about maybe one last thing I would say is that don't forget that 
actually we have a lot of power and that we actually have a lot of responsibility, each of us ourselves, and that there are small daily actions we can take to move the agenda. And sometimes we're not even aware of what those are, but it's whether you make that effort to say something positive about a female colleague, if you go that extra step to make sure you're connecting them, are you being an affirmative and active sponsor and champion? And we all get so busy that sometimes we don't think about this, but I actually think change isn't gonna just come from delegating it up to leaders and that we actually have lots of little things we can do ourselves all the time. So I, I would just say I would close with, there's a personal responsibility that each of us have as women who have, who have reached a certain stage in our careers to pay it forward all the time. Thanks, Samina. That's and on great. that, though, is I want to thank everybody for joining us today for this lively and engaging discussion. And especially thanks to you, Anita Bhatia of UN Women, for your keynote remarks and for part participating in the panel discussion. And I'm also glad that we could um, have uh, Gina Ambercrabi Win Stanley join us, too, for to jump in uh, now that you've joined uh, the board. And I want to say good evening to the rest of you.